My name is Eric Jones, and I'll be your moderator. And at 12, at 12 noon, we're going to have our groups break out into small discussions in, the, in groups of five. So immediately after this, we'll break out into, into groups of five. And so we're going to have the presenters introduce themselves. Okay. We start with you two. Introduction, yeah. I am Teresa Guardian. I've been uh, adjunct professor in Columbia for many, many years. I think I know already very familiar faces. And that's my teaching position. So I think you know me. I'm Katja Grudo Santos, and I'm the deputy director in charge of client services for the New York City Anti Violence Project, and I'm an adjunct here at Columbia uh, as well, and class of 92. Hi, I'm Kalima D'Souza. I'm the Communications and Outreach Manager at Black Women's Blueprint and an adjunct professor here at Columbia. Hmm. Hello, my name is Walter Vega. Um, I'm a CUSSW alum. I was formerly the Director of Advising here at CUSSW. And now I currently um, I teach here the Social Work Practice with Families course. I'm on faculty at the Ackerman Institute for the Family, and uh, I'm with a small nonprofit group, New Destiny Housing, uh, <laughs> uh, overseeing a family support program. Hi, I'm Carolina Hausman Stabil. I am an adjunct here. I teach a theory and treatment of suicide. And I am a student like you. I'm finishing my doctorate degree at Washington University in St. Louis. My research is around Latino families and children and mental health. Well, we definitely want to thank you guys for waiting to get started. Yeah. Uh, I should have added that I am an alumni also from the doctoral program. Uh, so, thinking of you and having to talk with privilege and power, I was thinking about what am I going to tell you? And the first thing that came to my mind is how important it is to be aware of ourselves and how this awareness keeps on changing as we grow older and as we do different roles and practices. You know, we are students and at the point very soon some of you will be practitioners in the field. And right now in the school, you are students. And so you are very aware of some of the pros and difficulties that you have among yourselves, with the professors, and in general with the community of the School of Social Work. Uh, what I thought is that I wanted to give an example of one ex a, a very last experience I had of power and privilege myself. Uh, and this experience I had about, I think, three or four days ago, so it's very fresh. I had to go to an, an office of the AT&T cellular telephones, and it was a very big office, and it, it repeated some of the experience I also have as a person uh, in general. Well, I went there, and of course there were a lot of people servicing, but there was a front desk with the person who you have to go first, as usual to say, what, why are you there? <laughs> so I went there, and that was a very lovely, very handsome person, a man behind the, uh, cent at the center. And he, I believe, I don't know from where, but he was a black young man. And I went to him, and it was my turn. But he suddenly jumped me and took the next person. <laughs> and the next person was a man who, 
again, I don't know where he comes from, but I always have difficulties knowing where are you. But he was a very handsome white man. So I immediately reacted with that idea, and I said, I was before the gentleman. And the gentleman behind me said, yes, absolutely, please come be before me. So he was very lovely. Now the, the leader there in front was not very happy with this, because it was obvious that he jumped me. And he was not very cordial with me. Now again, perhaps I was feeling already the, my own feelings of how I was reacting. And he immediately told me, when I told him what I wanted, that I wanted to learn more about the services of AT&T, etc., etc., and the contract, etc., he said, well, you know, we don't do any more that teaching here. You have to go into the internet. I don't know as much internet as you do, ladies and <laughs> gentlemen. So I, I said, no, I'm terribly sorry, but I cannot use as to, for the questions I have, etc. I want to talk with somebody. But he was not willing to give me that. So I immediately used one of my obvious defenses that I said, could you give me somebody that speaks Spanish? By the way, I am a Latina. Uh, some, maybe some of you don't know that, but I am a Latina. Uh, so he, she, he sent me to a very lovely Spanish woman which, of course, we connected immediately, language-wise, uh, color-wise, in every way. So she was lovely. And I said, this is what I always do. That's my defense. I always said I want to speak with, Span with somebody with Spanish, OK? So immediately, we did very well. And then she said, well, we, then you have to sign this contract. And of course, signing the contract, filling forms, she said, you have to have an identification with your picture and that you have to have your driver's license. Oh, I said, I'm terribly sorry. I don't have my driver's license with me. What can I do? And she said, well, we need the driver's license. I said, I have a visa card with my picture, which is very powerful, I think. But also, I have, I didn't think, but I have also the Columbia University card with my picture. And she really wanted to help me, but she didn't know how. So she said, you know what, I better go and ask this to my supervisor. So she went and lasted a little longer. So here, I, here it comes, the supervisor. He was so impressed with my Columbia card. Mm. <laughs> so that was the privilege and the, like this. Oh, he wanted to know what do I do at Columbia, uh, etc., etc. So now I got the best service. And I said, you know, the lady who was helping me, who I knew already her name, and blah, we connected very well. I said, she's helping me very well. So you don't need to take the time. No, 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 no. He wanted to help me with that, and he overruled that. I mean, very powerful. You know, so I thank him very much. He said, can I have, can I give him my card? <laughs> I mean, very powerful. So look at the different things that I experienced there. The sex difference, the culture difference, the language difference, and most important, the power. Mm -hmm. So I thought I should share that with you. And again, tell you that 
you have to be very self-aware of yourself, especially in your practice. You know, you can see I am the oldest here, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and I had quite a bit an experience in several roles, and I can use it a lot of time telling you the several experience I had both ways. One of me having the privilege and another one not having me the privilege. Thank you so much. Very lovely to be in this school and talking to you. So now I'm re reconsidering that we let Teresa go first because I have to follow her. Um, well, but I will do my best. The AT and P. <laughs> so it is really great to be here, um, <clears throat> and uh, I was excited to be part of this panel. And I think I'm going to sort of take my cue from Teresa and talk about self awareness a little bit personally and as it intersects with the professional. Excuse me. <clears throat> so those of you who have been in my classes, I see a few of you in the room. Um, will know that I continue to talk about power, privilege, and oppression. Some might say ad nauseum. Um, I'm OK with that. Um, and I think what I realized is I had a personal journey of understanding my own power, my own privilege, um, and how that intersected with experiences of oppression um, that I have experienced and continue to experience. Um, and I think what you realize early on with this self-awareness of which Teresa spoke is it's much easier to pay attention to the places in which you've been oppressed than the places in which you hold power and privilege, even though those things intersect. So um, it became clear to me early on as an activist um, that I was white. It was hard to realize that. I'd grown up in uh, a community that was almost entirely people of color. Um, and so when I realized I was white and had white privilege, um, it took me a long time to kind of work through that and figure out how to own that and neither um, never forget it for a minute, even though our culture would allow me to do that um, at a moment's notice, um, but realize uh, what that bought me in terms of power and privilege um, and what my responsibility was as a white activist and then social worker um, to be conscious of the things that I got um, that I didn't earn, purely by the basis of what I looked like. Um, I think it took me longer to realize my class privilege. Um, I actually grew up in a sort of a working poor family, um, but quickly realized um, that associated with white privilege was implied class privilege. I passed a lot. Um, and later, um, when I, in fact, arrived in the middle class, the elusive middle class, um, that it was sort of assumed I'd always been there, right? Um, and that was all related to my white privilege. Um, I knew that I was queer when I was probably about 14 or 15 years old. Um, I knew that uh, I was not limited to liking boys or girls. It was very confusing. It was the 80s. It was not easy. Um, trust me. Just trust me. Um, and so I had a lot of oppression based on sexual orientation, um, both from my straight friends uh, who Various of them told me I was doing unnatural things. Um, and from my gay friends who said, like, would you just decide who you are, for God's mm -hmm. sakes? Like, don't be a poser, right? So I had a lot of oppression around my sexual orientation. But again, still had my white privilege, still had my class privilege. Uh, and realized over that time, as I began to do more social justice work, that I had uh, the privilege of speaking English as my first language, that I was um, a citizen. Um, when I was working with undocumented folks, that was particularly clear to me, how I'd never thought about what that got me. Um, and uh, as I continued to do reproductive health work, worked in public hospitals, went to Columbia University School of Social Work, um, I realized also um, in doing um, queer work and work within queer communities um, that I had a lot of passing privilege. Uh, so fast forward a few decades, um, I married a guy, total passing privilege, marriage privilege, you name it. Um, but I decided to be more open about my identity. I experienced a lot of homophobia, biphobia when I came out. 
um, professionally. Um, and I decided, partly as a, as a result of that, to go into working full-time doing queer anti-violence work. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, and I found a way to do that. I was very, very fortunate um, to work at AVP, where we do uh, work within about violence within and against LGBTQ and HIV-affected communities. It was there that I learned my most recently understood uh, types of privilege, which was passing privilege, or really understanding what that meant for folks with whom I worked who don't have any passing privilege. Um, uh, my marriage privilege and sort of my relationship status privilege um, and my cisgender privilege. So my privilege uh, on being a cisgender woman and understand that while I certainly had experienced tons of sexism in my life, um, that I had really did not understand um, the depth to which um, transphobia impacts our communities, um, even for those who are uh, gender queer, gender nonconforming. So um, at each stage of me sort of understanding uh, my oppression, I had to also look at associated power and privilege and understand that that impacted the work I do, uh, the work that I do with my colleagues, and the work that I do with my clients, and um, at this point, the work that I do in coalition um, and uh, in advocacy, um, and understanding, as I teach my advocacy students who are now in the room, that I have to understand my identity and what how that plays into advocacy um, efforts in which I'm involved, right? I bring my privilege and my power to those spaces, and I like to think I use them for good, not evil, but I'm still using them, right? Um, and that I can also use that power and privilege sometimes to trump the oppression so that if somebody wants to be homophobic with me, I can just talk about, you know, I can speak from my Columbia place, right, and talk, talk from my power and privilege. Um, and, um, and I think the biggest and most difficult lesson to, for me to learn in that was um, to step back and speak less um, in order to um, not take up so much space um, in places where I have uh, leadership, um, uh, some of which is due to that unearned privilege and power, um, and that it is not my right nor my place to make space for anyone who has fewer privileges than I do to speak, um, but that what I can do is not take up quite so much space myself. Uh, it's a subtle difference, but frankly, it's really pretty difficult to do. Um, I'm delighted to be part of um, the New York City Anti-Violence Project. We are currently engaged in what is now about a two-year process of looking at the way in which our organization is structured and the way that we do our work to make sure that we are actually living anti-oppressive values and that we can recognize oppression as it manifests itself in our work um, through our relationships with each other and our policies, procedures, and our trainings. So I am committed to doing that work for the rest of my life, and I'm really great to, excited to be here and talk about it with you. So it's hard to follow these two ladies. Um, I will talk as a researcher in social work, not as a clinician, and the experiences as a scholar. And I will share two personal examples. In February, we got money from the Rockefeller Foundation, which is a very powerful organization, talking about powerful and privileged, uh, to go to Dominican Republic to do research about parenting and children outcomes. I'm white, I'm Latina, I grew up in Argentina, and I immigrated to the United States 10 years ago with my accent, so we arrived together. And <laughs> that's how I went to Dominican Re uh, Republic with a group of Latino researchers. We had 10 uh, research assistants uh, starting their careers in their masters, and I was coordinating this group. And one of my first surprises was that, because in Argentina we don't have African Americans or African South Americans or black people, um, I have never experienced what we see in America, the differences between white and black. On the other hand, I live in New York, and we share the public space, and we are completely mingled. I have people from every uh, national and ethnic and racial origin in my network, so I've never experienced a class completely divided. Even in the most segregated parts of the United States, we see interaction. Not so in some parts of the third world, and not so in Dominican Republic, which was my first clear experience of power, separation, and privilege based on race. I have never seen it before. I've been in Dominican Republic as a tourist, but never in the inner city collecting data. And I couldn't believe that in the public schools, everybody was black, and in the private schools, everybody was white. And 
there was no separation, there was no mingling, the, the barriers were so clear. So, and also coming from America to do research is a very powerful position, okay? And we were paying $10 for an interview that lasted 20 minutes. So in the private schools where people came with drivers um, and they were talking about parenting through their nanas, which are the nannies that take care of their children, we had a completely different experience because they're middle class in America and they basically didn't accept the $10. It was almost an insult and they were telling us about their shopping sprees in New York and everybody was dressed in a different manner and everybody was white. And then we went to the inner city slums which look, which look very different from our slums and there were people that waited till 11 p.m. making a line in the school for the $10 that we handed around 10 in the morning after waiting hours and hours in a line and everybody was dark skin. So I'm sitting there doing as many interviews as we could as fast as we can because we knew these people were waiting for us all night just for $10. How many of us waste $10 and nothing every week? And these people waited 10, 12, 14 hours for us to hand over $10. So we were, we felt very powerful. And our decision of ending the data collection left a lot of people that waited long for us without getting the $10. So I'm sitting and doing this interview, and I was starting to get annoyed because I had been four or five hours without drinking water and asking the same question, and I was kind of tired. And this lovely lady who had a couple of kids, and the kids were a little bit misbehaving, and you know, I was a little bit entitled at that point that I wanted to get out, and I wanted to go and refresh myself and get comfy. We ended the interview, and there was a bridging moment, and that's my point of this example, that we bridge understandings of power and privilege constantly in our work. She asked me if she could touch my skin because she had never interacted with somebody who was as white as I am, and she had never felt how it felt to touch a white skin, and my jar dropped. How do you respond to that? We are not preparing our profession to deal with those questions. So I asked her in exchange for touching my skin if I could touch hers. So it was a bridging opportunity to both of us learn how to interact with each other and also to show that there's, our skins felt the same and we were two women doing our job. My job as a researcher and her job as a subject and she volunteering and helping me and I'm helping her paying. So it was a really gratifying experience at the end that started in a way that it was a little bit uncomfortable because at the first moment, I didn't know how to react. And that goes to your self-awareness. So I come back to the United States, very happy and very proud of our work and how hard we worked. And I meet with a much more senior, experienced researcher who has millions of dollars in grants and who, like, I'm nothing next to that person, <laughs> okay? My work is meaningless. And this gentleman who is white, had, doesn't have an accent, has incredible grants and publications, and I'm just starting, and I'm a junior scholar, and I'm there to try to gain experience and make a connection. I sit there, not only he looks at me and calls me sweetheart, um, and I'm not nobody's sweetheart, <laughs> and I cannot say anything because I want to work with this person. Then he starts to say about his hesitation about working with Latinos because Latinos are so authoritarian. Latino women don't speak their mind, and we are so passive aggressive. And I'm just boiling inside, but I cannot say anything because I'm deciding if I have to continue this collaboration and let it grow because it's very important for my career. So this point is, not only we bridge constantly notions of power and privilege with others, but also the positions of power and privilege are very fluid. They're very plastic. So our own experiences, our own understanding of power and privilege can change minute to minute. And in the social work profession, because we have so many hats and so many roles. You might be in an emergency room as a social worker in an emergency room, and in, in front of the client, you are very powerful because you're making decisions about discharge, about calling ACS, about treatment, about who to involve in the treatment. And then you talk with the 
uh, attending, the physician that is in charge, are you are not that powerful. The decisions, are, the power is transferred, you know, immediately. So that awareness of where we are and what is happening, exactly. and how power and privilege are contextualized is something that we really need to become aware of, and bridge those opportunities to reshape what we think and what others think of us. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate everyone really speaking to the uh, the impact of intersectionality and how uh, contextualized power and privilege really can be. Um, I always tell my classes and uh, folks I work with, uh, you know, in in New York I'm I'm known as a man of color, but in Honduras where my family's from, I'm known I'm known as a gringo. So it's interesting, just depending on where you are, what that all means. Um, so wh what I what I want to do is just share with you a little bit of uh, some of uh, what I've seen and observed in uh, the, the the field, and I feel that as with many of us here, you know, I've worked in a variety of settings, and while uh, the settings are very different, the dynamics are very much the same. Uh, that I see, and one of those dynamics is that in the social service world, I mean, we are fighting for social justice, but very much we're working in a context, even in our agencies, even in our direct practice, we're working in a context that reflects very much the same world that we're trying to change. Um, one of the things that I think became so evident to me uh, when I first graduated as uh, I worked in preventive service, family preventive services, and I just sort of looked around, and I was really going through my own process of, of self-awareness and identity, and I looked around at, at just sort of the organizational structure of the agencies I would work for. And it was fascinating to me that, you know, while I think it's certainly changing, um, those in administrative managerial positions, by and large, were still white. And those frontline staff tended to be people of color. Um, now, you know, when you think about it and you think about how that's all structured, um, you know, while I don't think people would actually name it, often they would hire line workers to be people of color, well, for lots of reasons. Certainly, um, social workers, uh, these social workers would bring a lot of skill, a, a lot of um, potential to the field. But I think that something that goes unnamed often is that these are, fo uh, in, from the perspective of administration, these are folks that can connect clients in a particular way. And that I found to be both valuable, but in some ways a little exploitative, if you know what I mean. Um, and I think that that's something I've struggled with a great deal. Uh, because one, connection is very important. But of course, when you're thought to be someone to be able to connect with someone, then you're being limited in terms of your identity. It doesn't capture other parts of who you are that may, in fact, not connect with clients right off the bat. Does that make sense to folks? Um, so that's something that I think, you know, I, I think it's uh, something I learned right off the bat immediately and I think I struggled with. Um, for me, being a man of color, the son of an immigrant, um, being a male and the privilege that came with that, and also being someone that presented as white. Um, I think was really important. So when people said, you know, kind of gave this sort of impression, oh, you know, your parents are immigrants and, you know, you understand the immigrant experience, which to some extent I certainly do, certainly from the child's perspective to some extent. Um, but, you know, if I, if you, I were to have my mother come, you know, sit next to me on this panel, the t you know, you would say the two of you look nothing alike. My mother's very dark skin as I am pretty much white. And the privilege that that's conferred on, that, that I, that's sort of I've been, I've gained from that is immense. And so in my work, that's something I very much struggled with. And, and, and then on an organizational, sort of on an organizational perspective, that's something you notice and you try to make sense out of and say like, wow, this really kind of like, in, in, in a way, it's sort of your, your, the intentions seem to be good, but it ends up, as I experienced them, quite exploitative. Um, and I think in, uh, one of the things I, I didn't mention uh, par partially on purpose is I, I also do private practice. 
And, you know, I, I've, in my time here as director of advising, I would speak to a host of students who, whose dream was to be, you know, to go into private practice. And that was something they, you know, they wanted to be a psychotherapist, and that was really important. And my question to them, I, I would say, that's great. Why'd you come to social work school to do that? Right? And often students would struggle with that answer. I said, you could go to a mental health counseling program, right? You could do a PsyD program. You can go to medical school and become a psychiatrist. But why social work school and become a therapist? And I think it's because we often think of, and I was just talking to a student right now, we, we, we want to specialize our field so much that I think in the effort to specialize it, we often lose sight of our roots in the field. And yes, in clinical work, clinical work is about social justice work. Mm -hmm. And um, there are ways of doing that that I think often don't get taught. Um, and sometimes don't get taught not just in the academic setting, but I think also once you leave the academic setting into the professional world, it's not taught. And there are reasons for that, I think. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's just another thing that I observed both in, in becoming a clinician and the kind of clinical work that I wanted to do and the kind of clinical work I want to teach. Um, so what have I learned? Um, and, and sort of some thoughts that I just want to share with you about when you move on to the professional world and, uh, and practice. Um, and again, let me just sort of reiterate that how I learned this was as a um, man of color um, who presents as white. So there were some things that I think I was able to do, things that I thought I think I was able to sort of move forward that I definitely, as some people mentioned earlier, my privilege played a big role in it in being able to, to move it forward. Um, Hopefully you're all familiar with the work of Paulo Freire, and um, hopefully, um, and uh, you know he he talked a great deal about critical consciousness and raising critical consciousness. He worked with uh, workers in Brazil to teach them how to read, but he didn't just teach them how to read. He also talked to them about why they why it was they couldn't read in the first place, and I think that's a big part of what it means for us to be social workers, is to engage in conversations with our clients and our organizations that say, why, is it, why does the world look like the way it does now? And why is there a need for us in the world? And engaging in those conversations. Um, a sort of a bit of a hero of mine in the world of family therapy, Ken Hardy. Yes. Um, he, uh, he talks about when working clinically with folks, with families in particular, but you know, with anyone, he says it's really important to create breathing room in, in, in your sessions, in the space. And what does that mean? It means you create space for the sense of loss, for the sense of grief, for the sense of anger, and what's often for a sense of rage that people feel. It's scary to sit with, but you have to create space for it. That's what it means to create the breathing room. Once you're able to create that space, a host of opportunities can open up. Um, and I do this with staff that I supervise. I do this with students in my class. Um, and I urge them to do it with the, the folks they work with, with their clients. Um, and then just sort of the, the last two things that I, I want to leave you with is I think supportive spaces are incredibly important. I think this work um, can leave you sometimes feeling very alone. And in your agencies, Hopefully you have the support to do this. Um, I know it happens at CUSSW, but it's important to create supportive spaces along whatever lines. Supportive spaces for women, supportive spaces um, for people who identify as queer, supportive spaces for people of color, wh what, what have you. But those supportive spaces have to be there to create a forum um, for folks to share experiences that they may not feel uh, there's an, uh, an environment that welcomes those experiences. And then finally, and possibly the most challenging, is how to speak truth to power. Um, when you're in agencies and you're a line worker or you're even your middle management, and you realize that there are, uh, within your agencies, within your organizations, ways that um, are sort of repeating the oppression um, that our clients experience, finding strategic ways to speak truth to it. Because let's face it, folks, we got to keep our jobs, right? And I just actually spoke to uh, a staff member of mine just about what I was doing today. And, and she said, 
make sure to remind them that, you know. I mean, it absolutely, we are, you know, many of us consider ourselves activists and we want to go out there and change structures, absolutely. Sometimes you kind of have to stroke power to speak truth to it. Sometimes you have to strategically work within the power system to speak truth to it. Um, how you do that, well, maybe we'll offer a class around that. And, and maybe, maybe this is a, you know, that's, maybe that's a team taught something here with this panel. But, um, but, but that's, that's really critical. I mean, you can't go in there guns a-blazing um, just right off the bat. Because another thing that Ken Hardy says when he talks about what are the tasks of subjugated people, he says you have to find effective ways of channeling your rage. It's critical to do. So I leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. So I, I want to thank everyone on this on this panel. Um, I'm gonna anchor this panel and ground it, and I I'm using everyone's um, contribution to do that, especially um, bu just building off of what um, Teresa, or Teresa, and Catherine and Walter. Um, said and then using your example of being in a different country as you know a white skinned privileged Latina. I think is what what happened this conversation what happened here was modeling some of the things and some of the ways in which we can show up in the world and own our privilege and I also want to invite folks if you you know I, I'm quite sure some things were said on this panel that probably triggered you right like I'm gonna say I was triggered right mm -hmm. People were triggered, and it's okay. And if you need to take care of yourself, take care of yourself. And also, want to invite you to challenge what, what to bring it up, mm -hmm. to speak to it right now, so we can model what this work actually looks like on the ground, rather in theory. Right? Mm -hmm. This is the space to do that. I'm going to talk about what does power and privilege do? What does that look like in terms of allyship? What does it look like on the ground? Mm -hmm. Because it's good for us to have it here, and even to have it here. But to have it here, like on the ground, like moving, marching with folks on the ground is totally different. Um, and I think that that's where we struggle. Yeah. Even in the way in which we present ourselves and even in the way we, we identify ourselves. Catherine talked about um, always wanting to identify with our subjugated selves and Walter talked about the same thing. And I would encourage all of you to sort of do a little bit of research around Ken Hardy's task of the privilege and task of the subjugated. Because it's really easy for us to go to that space of subjugation, that, that space of oppression. Rather than saying that I also have privilege. I am an Afro-Latina woman. And I am clear that I'm Afro-Latina. Clear. And I walk with a lot of privilege. And what does that mean when I'm in a space with other people who may not have that same kind of privilege? Like Catherine, I'm queer, proudly so, <laughs> right? And that means that I date men and I date women. And at any day and time, if I feel like I want to date a man or be in relationship to a man, that I, am, I know I'm walking through the world with a lot of privilege because society is going to accept me. Mm -hmm. When I was walking through 42nd Street with my female partner, my woman partner, this weekend, someone came up to us and said, Jesus saves. <laughs> and I literally said, yeah, because he just saved your ass. <laughs> because I'm not going to jump on you. Right? But it's a very different reality. You know, as I'm walking through with her and I'm saying to myself, we are unsafe. And if you are unsafe, if I'm unsafe, we are all unsafe. Mm -hmm. So how do I use my privilege to advance on the ground, not in theory, on the ground stuff for folks who don't have access? And I think that, again, like I'm going to say, that's where we struggle. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I'm inviting folks to say and to do in this work is to really do an inventory of your privileged self. Mm -hmm. Where are you privileged? Walter talked about, I'm glad that he, taught, he said that he's a Latino, Latino man. Because him, as a man, he's walking through this, these hallways in this school of social work that's probably 90% women with more power than all of us amassed together. Let's, let's be real, right? He comes into this space because he's a man, he's doing this work with more, more power and privilege and access and, and people are holding him up. He's so great because he's a man talking about sexism. 
he should be talking about sexism because as men, they perpetuate sexism, right? Like, why does he get more power and privilege than the rest of us? Because he's a man in a 90% school of women, right? So for him to own that is revolutionary. It is an example of what it looks like to be in allyship with these four other women or identified women on this panel. What does it look like for Catherine to name the fact that she is queer and that she is, she's white with privilege? That, and even to talk about passing, because we have to talk about passing. Yeah. For us not to talk about mm -hmm. passing, we are operating in alignment with the same structures that put us in this place in the first place, right? What else can we do? We can mount our resources. So if you have resources and you're in true allyship with folks, if that resource is access to free space, to free copies, mm -hmm. if you got creative stuff that you can do, if it's money, deploy your resources in support of folks who are on the ground that do not necessarily have access to those resources. Do not be stingy and don't be confused. Maybe sometimes folks feel like, I really want to get involved. I want to, I want to march with you. I want to organize with you. But sometimes what we need is your money. <laughs> right? That's right? Sometimes what we need is access to a free space so we don't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes we need you to design a flyer for free and our website too. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Because you have access. You have resources. What can you do? Rick Ross. Did y'all hear about the Rick Ross thing? Mm -hmm. Rick Ross said, he basically said you can put a, a molly in, somebody, in a woman's drink and then take her home and she'll enjoy it. Basically perpetuating rape culture. Mm -hmm. Even when Kovangene Qu 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 Wallace was called a cunt, few white feminists rose up in, in, in support right. or in, in right. resistance to what is happening. Now, they tweeted, but the problem with Twitter is that Twitter is like, it's here now and it's gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Or it's probably here now and gone in two seconds. Right? How do we deploy our resources in a way that, that makes a lasting impression on the institutions, on the conversation? So rather than tweet, how about you write a piece mm -hmm. in, in support? How about you be vocal and visible and defiant in your support for people that you call yourselves being in allyship? Mm -hmm. Folks with privilege, even for me, because I have privilege and I'm going to own that, we like to be safe. And I say, you do, in order for you to be in real allyship, you got to be careful. You got to be so comfortable with being unsafe right. that you live in perpetual fear every day. Mm -hmm. But you rise up any day and you say, I dare you, because you know that you're not moving alone, right? These are the things that I say in terms of power and privilege. Don't have it just to have it. And then call yourself a social worker or call yourself a good person or call, don't don't do it. Use your power and use your privilege to advance real issues yes. for real people at real time. Yep. Not at 10 days later, in the moment. Because this work as social workers, as real true change agents, is the real deal, y'all. Like when y'all leave these nice little halls of Columbia, is the real deal. And if I'm not safe. I don't care how much privilege you have, you're not safe. Because mm -hmm. our liberation is interconnected. I want to take this time to thank our panelists once again. And we, have, we still have some time left. And I can feel the energy in the room that there's a lot of questions and that need to be asked or would like to be asked. But I would ask that you guys be mindful of the time because we do have to shift into a, um, into a different uh, panel after this one. So the podium, I mean the stands here for those that have a question. And again, please be mindful of the, of the time. We have 10 minutes or so left. Hello, I'd, I'd just like to thank you for our discussion. So I had this, this um, feeling over the weekend about privilege. I don't believe that I'm privileged. I go to school here. I'm a veteran. So there's all these different things that I get because of, I think, luck. Uh -uh. Uh -huh. But let me speak it real quick, though. Because cause I come from a humble background, and my family has been humble. And, you know, I got out of that situation through what we call work and reading and, and writing. 
But when I go to different venues, I realize that that privilege is, is nothing. Mm -hmm. So my, my, um, my first experience is when I drove down Church Avenue a couple of weeks ago after Kamani Gray was murdered, that's what I'll call it, mm -hmm. and I seen police cars all over the place. Mm -hmm. and I seen horses and I seen um, young black kids walking around. And I'm driving down Church Avenue and they say, fuck you nigga, what are you doing? I'm like, why are you mad at me? Because I didn't kill this young man. And I'm actually here feeling really bad because if someone killed my child and they put a whole bunch of police officers in the, in the neighborhood, I would feel really bad and I would feel really weak. I think that they're bullying people that look like me, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that easily I could have been in that situation. So I know that that's something that could happen to me easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I go to my field work, which is at the Fortune Society, mm -hmm. and I see Fortune, Fortune Society. Society. Mm -hmm. And I sit in groups with these young men who look just like me. Mm -hmm. When I was their age, just like me. Mm -hmm. And they tell me their story about, yeah, I got in trouble for this, and I got in trouble for that, just like me. And I was just able to luckily escape to the military mm -hmm. and try my hand at something else. Mm -hmm. And when I leave that room, I feel really bad because their stories mm -hmm. end with, well, what are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. And what's the next plan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when I understand that, like that fake thing that I walk around the school with, that fake sense of privilege. Right. And that's why I call it, I call it fake because I, I, I also don't fit in. There's like five, six, seven of me that look like me in this room. There are not that many black men in, in this in this room, right? But <laughs> you know, and there's all, always that other thing about when I talk to my brothers and and we don't have the same kind of goals and objectives. So we fight each other and we don't agree about things. So when I so where I'm going with this is when you you have self awareness and you and you do know what's going on mm -hmm. and then you feel like when you sit in front of the person who's supposed to be your clinical director and he says well i don't believe in cultural competency mm -hmm. i believe people that sit in front of me are, cl are patients not clients this isn't an out client clinic it's an outpatient clinic so for me to voice myself, I look like how I feel because inside I'm an angry black man and sometimes if you've been in rooms with me, you know I'm always saying something because I'm frustrated of course. so that, that privilege kind of gets stepped down a little bit when someone says, well, yeah, he's just angry black man just talking about things. I'm not, I'm, I'm bringing these points out, and I'm sorry. I just want to hear when you, when you sit in that privilege and you sit in that room, how do you feel or how do you take that anger down a little bit so it doesn't come out mm -hmm. as, you know, an angry black person or an angry person, which I'm angry. So, yeah, that's the truth. That's Thank you. I don't have I don't have a complete answer to that, but I have a, a, a piece um, that I just want to address. I don't know if the goal is to take down the anger exactly. Do you know what I mean? I think that there needs to be space for it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think there needs to be a space for it, and I, I think there needs to be a space uh, to talk about exactly what that experience is, is doing to you. Do you know what I mean? I, th I think that, and, and maybe you don't have that space right now, whether it's in class, whether it's in at your field placement, I, I, I don't know. But I think creating, and that's what I was talking about earlier, that breathing room mm -hmm. to be able to speak to all parts of that experience. Because it's, I, I, I mean, if, if I'm, you know, I'm, I just sort of have to like acknowledge this. It's interesting that, you know, I hear you talking about that struggle and I'm watching you in your Columbia gear yeah. Yeah. at the same time. So it's like, yeah. I think that's something that needs some space needs to be made to kind of work, you know work work through that. Do you know what I mean? Because I think that there is some privilege there, and 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 owning that, in and of itself, might be a might be a struggle. So that just speaks to a piece of it. Uh, uh, if I can add something from a clinical perspective, anger has a destructive connotation, but also has a constructive connotation. The Absolutely. energy that mm -hmm. anger gives you allows you to accomplish things and create. Yeah. So it's not that anger has to be eliminated. It right. has to be directed in a way that allows you to grow and own it and, and shape something mm -hmm. positive, which you are doing in your life. Yeah. Okay, so we have three more questions, and let's be mindful of the time because we do have to transition. And before we take this next question, let's thank Teresa, who's having to leave, for her, her <laughs> profound words. And Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody who shared on the panel today. Um, my question kind of um, stems from what I was saying, like, okay, in being a social worker, understanding that we're doing like a lot of self-awareness and trying to understand our privilege and whatnot, but my question is like, going off what he said, like how do you approach like um, maybe your bosses or the supervisors or even professors when we claim that, you know, we're trying to be anti-oppressive, but the very language that we use when addressing, you know, the people that we're working with in our communities and the way that we approach working with these, working with people is very, um, oppress, oppressive mm -hmm. in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, ugh, I'm nervous right now. Um, like, how, like, how do you address that? Like, how do you approach that when it seems as if, like, nobody in an organization may be aware that what they're doing is oppressive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An excellent yeah. question. Yeah. Um, I'll start, but y'all should jump in. So um, I think I think you hit it. I think that's the question: is how do we do that? Um, mm -hmm. I think that, as Walter said, and as Kalima said, I think we have to st do that strategically, mm -hmm. um, so that if you're the only person who notices that, and you're a student in your placement, there is the fact that you can't get fired because you're a student in your placement, <laughs> uh, but you might want a reference. So you have to think about kind of your audience and how something will be met. I think that we at the school have a responsibility to engage in those conversations with you mm -hmm. and help you find a strategy <clears throat> to not leave oppression or structural racism or structural classism intact <clears throat> and to try to deal with it. So I think it's important that you know it. It's important that you own it, that this is troubling to you and you want to do something about it. And there should be allies here at the school and the power structure to help you with that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it is also, we have to understand that I think it is an allyship, as Kalima spoke to, that that's where things do get better. Mm -hmm. um, and as someone who's an aspiring ally around racial oppression, I know that I try really, really hard to often be the, the person who is white, who voices something about racism. Um, and I really appreciate it when somebody else who's straight identified, identifies something around sexual orientation or gender identity, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to sort of build those allies because none of us alone can fix this, mm -hmm. right? right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's about ally building. I think it's about identifying where are things coming. But if you're working for an organization, and certainly we know they're out there, mm -hmm. where the whole service model is oppressive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's hard to know where to start. Mm -hmm. And that's more like you need to consult some folks and, yeah. and, and work around it. Yeah. Um, I know as a professor in teaching advocacy, I really push and push and push. And um, my students will tell you, I probably push too much. I want them to analyze the impact that power privilege and oppression has have on the issue as they define it, the issue as it is publicly defined, right. the right. proposed solution, mm -hmm. the way they analyze that and the way they're going to go about it. And that I don't want just to understand how racism impacts poverty and impacts nutritional value in school lunches. I want to know how is that impact in the way that that issue is talked about, mm -hmm. framed, addressed, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's about integrating never being done with integrating this into the work that we do. Right. I, I just want to encourage, it's, it, the thing is, like when we wake up, we wake up, and then we want everybody to be, have, be awake with us, mm -hmm. right? But we have to remember that we are all socialized under the same system. We have had 12 years of racist, sexist, homophobic, all kind of stuff, excuse my language, it's about to, you know, that we've been socialized systematically to believe and think about ourselves and other people. So when we meet somebody ignorant, you gotta meet them right where they are mm -hmm. because they've had years of socialization. And so how do we chip away? Mm -hmm. So even the fact that you walk in and you walk with your earrings and your natural hair, you are making a statement straight up and down. Right, like how do we, how do we make a statement in our spaces? I have Malcolm X on my wall, you know, like you have, you make a visible statement like this is not to be tolerated. That I know who I am and I know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. And then when you're having a conversation, be clear about what, what is like, what is bothering you in a way that says, I know that you, I'm going to take, I'm going to take the, like, give you the benefit of the doubt. 
I know that you don't mean to be racist right now, mm -hmm. but I'm going to let you know that you are being racist mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to invite you for a further conversation. Mm -hmm. And as students, you have process recordings that you could light into stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In your papers, in your process recordings, there's multiple ways to be strategic to chip away at the system. Mm -hmm. You've got to figure out what your sphere of influence is and activate it. Mm -hmm. In allyship, in collaboration, in partnership with other folks in your space. Thank you. And we have time to last two questions. Hi. Well, you are already kind of answering my question, but I want a little bit of an expansion. Um, my name is Kara C.A. Student, white, female, middle class, heteronormative, the whole thing. I'll identify as that. Um, I'm trying to, I'm from California as well, and want really happy for the opportunity to be in New York and, and learning a whole slew of more information on how to go beyond just the diversity and cultural competency trainings I had so often and moving really into an anti-oppressive lens. Um, I have been struggling this year as well, though I, you know, I went to the Undoing Racism training, I've been part of Sway, doing, um, starting to really hopefully ramp up to a second year of great work at the school and in my placement. Um, and I'm struggling with the information that I'm now and the, the knowledge that I'm gaining um, with creating allies among people that are white middle class, you know, non-queer, mm -hmm. and how to have those conversations because even outside the school very much so, but even inside the school. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll get responses from friends like, well, have, you know, has anyone else tried to apply to UC because, you know, white students are pushed out of the University of California system or just like little comments. And I, without, after the undoing racism training, it was really hard to come home and not like start telling every white person that they're racist and <laughs> like going about this. And you know, I had a couple conversations that didn't end well, and so I kind of had to, you know. And I'm finding ways, but I don't know if you can give any other way of how. You know, we're talking about the systematic kind of trauma that we all experience from being raised in this country yeah. too. Trauma stewardship. I'll put a plug in for that yeah. book. I'm reading it right now. Um, it's so good. I'm going to put it up on the Facebook page and stuff. And um, yeah. but how do we, as white allies, create other white allies, yeah. and just yeah. yeah. I just, just want to ask one question. Are there any um, white anti-racist organizers in this space right now? These are the people you should be talking to. <laughs> Go ahead and build community. Keep your hands up so she can know. This is serious. You guys need an affinity group. Yeah, you need an affinity group because the thing is, people of color can't be the people that's having those conversations with white folks. White folks who are committed to undoing white supremacy from within need to do the work with other white folks, right? And so I, I would invite you to, like, I, let me tell you something. I Trust me, I want to be in allyship with you, right? Mm -hmm. However, I want, to, I want you to have a community. So even when I'm not here, mm -hmm. that you always have a community of people who look like you, who have your shared experience, mm -hmm. to support your growth in this movement. Right. And so I am encouraging someone here to start a white anti-racist affinity group yes, here. Yes, thank you. Here you go. And she <laughs> will be the caucus leader, and you will get some <laughs> work done, right? All right. Yeah. And we will support you. But I'm also hoping that everyone understands at the school that it's okay to also have white spaces for people to have those conversations. Absolutely. That Absolutely. It is critical. It is, it is critical. Mm -hmm. And I need to go to the, the anti-racist white groups also citywide. But that I, if I bring that into the space in Columbia and other students, that that will be understood as well as part of the struggle. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And, yes, and this whole community will hold you accountable <laughs> to yep. creating that conversation. To doing that. Ah. To following we'll through. Follow you. through. Mm -hmm. So this will be our last question because we have the breakout groups. I hate to go, <laughs> I hate to go last. With, um, but Kalima, you said to be courageous and to mm -hmm. speak on something if it comes up. Yeah. So I'm doing that right now. Mm -hmm. And I, need, I have a thought that I need to be checked on or I need to just be confirmed mm -hmm. with by the community. I've been thinking a lot about this notion of privilege of, of men within social work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've been thinking a lot about how much privilege I have walking around these hallways, and mm -hmm. especially as a man of color, what mm -hmm. that means. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd like to complicate it a little bit That's more that. because I think that while I have male privilege that I carry wherever I go, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. Where, like to the bank, to the line at McDonald's, it doesn't matter. I have it. Um, how much male privilege do I have within a feminized profession? Mm -hmm. um, 
-hmm. How much mm -hmm. space do I have to be a male within mm -hmm. this profession? Mm -hmm. um, and is there an identity of a male social worker for me to, to fill? Mm -hmm. And I feel like I don't really have a place to be a male in this, in this profession. Now, it is true that I have the advantage mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it is a mostly female profession and because oppression affects so many men of color, that, and like you were saying, people assume that we're going to be um, kind of able to connect with men of color too, and that, and that is very limiting. Like last year, I didn't get any female clients. Mm -hmm. You know, I, they they would bring me kids and say like, oh, he just needs a, I think he needs some like a father figure or some male time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, he needs to do his homework. Like, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not here for that. Um, so I think. And it, but at the same time, I have seen myself be the one who people praise for being like analytical and like, mm -hmm. and you, Kara, thank you for your being so organized mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. it happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but this is this is this is an advantage that I have, that I have, and my privilege is being able to do to use it at at a very low cost. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I can claim to be, I can use, I can walk in like a man and say. This is the plan. This is what we're going to do. X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And people will listen because yeah. they expect that out of a man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but like when, as a profession as a whole, mm -hmm. when I think about is there a space for male social workers, mm -hmm. I think that we have a lot of work to do for that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of that work is on us men to come into the profession and, and like be proud and brave mm -hmm. about who we are and say like this is how it should be. But there's also a lot of resistance there. And mm -hmm. I feel it in class all the time whenever I have to bring up, well, you know, what about guys or the situation? Like we learn about um, like domestic abuse all the time and men in the situation are never talked about. Mm -hmm. I mean, that hurts both ways mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for women because the men are the perpetrators, but also, there's no programs, there's a dearth of programming for men. And whenever I bring it up, I'm like, oh, do I really want to do this right now? Is this like, are people listening? And I haven't gotten the best reactions. So I guess it's like, I don't know how to handle my privilege in this setting. And I'm not sure how much, if, it, if I have an advantage, I know it. Do I have a privilege in a feminized, in a feminized world? Like, I don't know. And I feel sometimes like I have to like elbow my way into conversations. And at the same time, I'm like learning a whole new way of being because I can't be a guy. I can't be like a man's man. I'm an, I'm gonna get thrown out the building for that. Mm -hmm. But I, I and I can't be just, I can't be a woman. Not to not not to say that like you know women are less or whatever. But I cannot be. I, this that's not me. I have to be myself. But but how do I fit that into where I'm at? So I guess. I, I just want to feel yeah, what you say. I mean, I, I have just a just a short response to that. Is I, you know, I think that's a that's a an individual process for how you sort of want to carve that out. And I would definitely, and I know the work that the two of us have done together on, you know, men of color supportive space. At the end of the day, whatever it is, you have the privilege to make that space. Do you know what? It, whatever it, whatever the outcome is, you have the privilege to make it. Because the fact is. If we wanted to be a man's man, mm -hmm. I don't think we would get thrown out of the building, right. to be honest with you. We might get looked at, you know, you might get looks, you might get not have a lot of friends, but we could if we wanted to. And in sure. fact, in a lot of the organizations I've worked in where men are in charge, they are very much, they, they, they almost like free license now, man. It's yeah, like, you know what I mean? And, and so, so I think that, that's, that that space is available to us. The space that captures the complexities of what it means to be a man is open to us if we want to. We just have to figure it out, and it's almost, you know what I mean? Like, I think that's just joining with other men to kind of figure out what that space is. But whatever it is, I think we can take the privilege of making it. I just wanted to add something really quick, and I thank you for raising this. I think it's a really good question. Um, again, I think that, that the, the, the pivotal piece here is that all of our power, privilege, and oppression is intersectional. Mm -hmm. And that when you find yourself in a place where the place where you're used to having privilege is now not getting you as much privilege, which I talk about with my, uh, my white students all the time, where suddenly you're like, oh, perhaps it's not so great that I'm white. Oh, you know. Um, 
and I'm mocking, but I'm mocking with love. Um, that I think, I think that's a point that's really difficult because it is intersectional. It is, you were exactly right when you said, this is really complicated, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's about, as, as Walter said, your own journey around those things, and as Kalima said, to find in the allies to talk about it. Um, I also have been in the field for over 20 years, starting when I was five. Um, and in that, in that time, I can tell you, I have never seen a guy graduate from this school and not be able to find the job. I have seen a lot of gals who graduate from the school and have trouble finding a job. Because again, when you are a smaller proportion, and that may be what is deemed appropriately or not as necessary for a job, you got less competition, right? So there's pros, there's cons. It's all individual, the, in, the opportunities. Um, I would also say to you, so I, I have been an anti-domestic violence advocate for 30 years. Um, and I spend most of my time with my sister advocates in spaces where I talk about the boys. Because we are where we were 30 years ago for men who experience intimate partner violence right now, people. Don't ever, don't think that because you're a woman, you're, you're out of this, right? Men are abused by feminine partners. Men are abused by male partners. Men are abused by trans partners. And, um, you know, last year, the report that my organization did on intimate partner violence in the United States, over 50% of the victims of murder were men. So... There are places where once you intersect something, which is usually around sexual orientation and gender identity, once you add the intersection, suddenly privilege and power are all in, in the ether and very complex. So I think it's continuing to do that inventory that Kalima talked about um, and not losing sight of where that privilege is um, and that you don't sort of get to count it sometimes and not count it other times in the same way that you don't get to sort of ignore your oppression, right? and to get allies around it. So yeah. thank you for raising it. Yeah, and I just want to say one thing. Just, I'll be really quick, because I love <laughs> our hennies, and he knows that. Um, so you use a couple of terms that I'm going to have to push back on okay. you, and we can continue this conversation outside. Um, the feminized profession, mm -hmm. yeah. we need to we need to define that, at first, mm -hmm. first of all. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Because I know that we are a profession that's predominantly women, and we, we serve predominantly women. I don't know what it means to be feminized. Mm -hmm. That language is problematic because it, it, it brings in a totally different characteristics of sort of like, like ideas of what it does mean to be feminized, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's one. The, the second thing is when you're saying like to be a male in this, this, um, this, this profession, how are you defining being a male? What's, mm -hmm. what's being a male? You said like when we come in and we do this and we do that, we do that. That's being masculine. That's being male identified to, in terms of masculinity mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of espousing masculine traits of being. And I'm not sure that that's, that, that that's who we want to be. Like, that's who you want to be. Or, like, why are you, like, how is your identity sort of, what is your masculine identity in this profession? It's probably some of the work that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing that I want to say is that, you know, just building off of what Catherine and Walter said in terms of like this bit of personal journey, I think it is also a collective journey mm -hmm. um, of, of understanding male privilege and that everybody, irrespective of race, has male privilege. Um, and how do you necessarily, how do you, how do you hold on to that and hold on to the other, your other identities that are not necessarily privileged? in this particular space. So just like Catherine said, there are going to be many of us that's not going to be able to find work, It's not going to get the praise that you get, not to, you know, all of that, even in this space. I'm telling you, honey, even in this space. And you've got to be able to know for sure that because just simply because you are a male, you get it. And that's OK. It's just how you're going to use that privilege to advance everything else that you're in allyship with, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so let's, let's, I, I, I would love to have this conversation about how you identify, like, what is, what's your definition around being male in this profession? Uh, well, not, right? not now. You want to go into that? No, not now. <laughs> not, not now. now. Not now. <laughs> but you and I. I would like to add something. Uh, so, because I, I really love your question. Yeah. And I love your rationale because you brought so many interesting things to it. Um, and I think it was very brave for me to come here and, and share with you because we have been a tough set of, uh, you know, giving you feedback or whatever. So 
in order also to change things, we have to move things in relationship with others. And I'm talking with you in front of everybody, but also out of the room. Mm -hmm. And there is a journal of social work education. And I think your question is very valid. And in our profession, we are not talking about that. Mm -hmm. But more and more men are coming into our schools. So there is a shift in the culture of the schools that has to take place. And I encourage you to write a letter to the editor, not only because that will amplify the, this conversation that we are having, but also will help you to think of what you are really thinking, going to your point. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe start to move the conversation that we need to have in our profession about the things you are bringing in our education of social workers. So mm -hmm. just... Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. I have the